Um, well, when I was younger, I worked in a Christian bookshop. Uh, there was one particularly unpleasant customer um, who used to come in. And throughout the time I was there, he'd managed to send in an official complaint about every member of staff. Uh, one uh, for unbiblical behavior. Uh, one of them had a tattoo. Another one was a, a lady who wore makeup. Uh, of course, I was a man with long hair. And all of this was deeply unbiblical. Um, but the biggest complaint, he actually um, came in and accused us of selling blasphemy. Um, and that was because we had a book on our shelves that we were selling called The Lost Message of Jesus, um, which was by a Mr. Steve Chalk. Um, and that was my first introduction to Steve's work. And Steve, you couldn't hope for a more glowing recommendation than upsetting this chap. Um, Steve has been a longtime ally of the LGBT plus community. Um, he pastors the Oasis Church in Southwark in London in the UK, um, which is set up as a fully inclusive congregation. He is the founder of the charity Oasis, which is known for its youth work, its schools work, anti-human trafficking activism, uh, numerous other activities. Um, he's wrote, written over 40 books, according to Wikipedia, um, which I'm glad that grumpy ex-customer didn't realize, otherwise he would have burnt the shop down. Um, he's very well respected speaker on a number of subjects, including inclusion. Um, and I know for one um, that a number of um, members of the LGBT community um, that I've spoken to have um, felt greatly encouraged and affirmed by hearing Steve's words. Um, so I'm sure tonight is going to be uh, um, another one of those occasions where we get to hear him speak with, with passion and integrity. So without further delay, I would like to introduce you and pass you over to Steve Chalk. Great. Uh, can you all see me? Yeah, great. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> Welcome. What an extraordinary uh, thing that is. The, the book, The Lost Message of Jesus, I'm going to refer to that just uh, uh, for, for a moment or two as, as I continue. It's a wonderful uh, privilege for me to be with you all uh, this evening. So thank you for inviting me or in Kathy's case uh, this morning I guess thank you Kathy for the things you uh, just said which are truly fascinating truly fascinating I've been asked to talk about Oasis Oasis Church and Oasis as an organization our journey towards being inclusive and the role of the church as I see it now and uh, in the future um, so I need to uh, tell you a little bit about our roots because you know the foliage of any tree in the end is dependent on its roots they spread out they head in different directions and the tree draws its nutrition from each one of those roots and there are several roots for us as an organization around the UK and in other countries where Oasis works now that um, really have informed our journey to towards inclusion and um, the first one is cultural. Uh, because I'm the founder of Oasis, Oasis in the UK now has around 6,000 staff. We run 53 schools. We have 32,000 students, I, I, I think it is, in our schools. The government have just given to us an old youth jail that was run by a big company in the UK, well-known G4S. Um, and the, there was a, an expose documentary on BBC TV about the abuse there. And uh, so a new piece of law is just headed through Parliament, which will allow o Oasis to become the first charity to run a prison, which we will run not on a, uh, but the basis of retribution, but the basis of restoration, uh, therapeutically informed. So we're in, involved in all of those things. But the question is, where did Oasis come from? Um, Oasis badge, if you ever look up our website or whatever, or you were to see some of the kids from some of our, one of our schools on a bus, if you're in the UK in the morning, you'd see that our, uh, our logo is the O of Oasis, which is a very squiggly O. You can talk to the kids in our schools or our staff or you know, all the people that are involved in the uh, community projects that we run across the country and our, our churches, then I'll tell you this squiggly O is our O of inclusion. It's squiggly, it's many stranded. It's many stranded because inclusion is always messy, but it's many stranded because when you look at it, the many strands make it strong. 
So right at the start, and even written into our badge, if you like, is this concept of inclusion. So where did it come from culturally? Well, because I'm the founder, I guess you give birth to something in your own image. I'm Anglo-Indian. My mum uh, was English. My dad was Indian. Uh, he came from India to the UK. I was born uh, in the mid-1950s, bang slap in the middle of the 1950s. And uh, so I was born into a home where I soon learned that uh, many of my mum's relatives, white relatives, would never speak to my dad. They wouldn't come to our house when he was there. I'd walk down the street with him, a really dark skinned Indian, and people, I'd watch them as a little boy cross the road rather than speak to him. So I guess that I grew into an atmosphere where I understood what prejudice was as a result of his colour, um, and his inability in those times to find employment, um, uh, 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 um, continuous employment. We're also, I also grew up in a house that was poor. So I knew about the intersectionality of these uh, prejudices and these poverties that ground uh, uh, families down. And I guess that on becoming a uh, Christian, which I did at the age of 14, Although I became a Christian through a church, which was wonderful, but really their gospel was believe now because it's a giant insurance policy for after you die. You know, where will you be? Uh, where will you be after you die? Will the God of heaven allow you into his heaven? Why should the God of heaven allow you in? Do you know what your eternal destiny is? Though I was born as a Christian into that kind of environment, for some reason, um, I never quite got it, that theology, and from the start had this inbuilt desire to work to overcome prejudice and oppression and to create inclusion. And all I can say, self-analyzing the best I can, is that, of course, came from my home situation and, uh, and, and what I saw. Um, as Oasis was born in 1985, Oasis began, uh, we began working in poor communities. We work in many poor communities. We work solely in poor communities across, uh, across the countries we work in today, as well as in the UK. So for instance, in terms of our school, something that's much in the news in the UK right now is free school dinners. And there's a national debate going on about whether children who, uh, who are given a free meal each day because of the poverty of their situation, financial poverty of their situation during term time should be granted that meal uh, during, during the, the holidays. The national average for the number of children who receive a free meal because their parents' income falls below a particular line, uh, uh, level of income is 14.7, I uh, think 14.8%, just under 15% anyway. The, the, uh, the number of children in our schools that receive uh, free school dinners is almost 50% because of the poor communities we work in. And so as Oasis has grown over these three and a half decades, what I've discovered is that people are oppressed in whatever form of poverty they suffer, whatever form of exclusion they suffer by the dominant narrative. The dominant narrative overrides human need time after time after time. So that's culturally. Theologically, um, I guess, you know, all these things marry into one, they mix, don't they? But it was in 2003, actually, I think, that I wrote that book, The Lost Message of Jesus, which was banned. It was wonderful. It was still being sold in your shop. So many shops took it, took it out of sale. People even sold, those who chose to sell it, sold it, I'm told, in brown paper bags. It was kept under the counter. You had to uh, go in and ask for a copy. And all I was saying uh, there uh, throughout the book, the lost message of Jesus, was the lost message is the message we've already talked about this evening. Love. Go and teach everybody all that I've taught you. What did Jesus teach us? Love. It's not about power. It's not, it's not power that lasts. It's love. Love never fails, says Paul, that 
follower of Jesus, you know, six or seven years younger than Jesus, this man whose life is transformed by Jesus. Love never fails, he says. He's in the writing within the context of the Roman Empire. He doesn't say it's power that never fails. And in that book, I therefore talked about the fact that I couldn't buy a version of the narrative of the cross, which was all about an angry God having his wrath satisfied through watching the death of his son and his desire for blood being satisfied. I said, that can't be the way to understand the cross. We're not talking about uh, uh, theories of atonement here, but, but the reason I mention it is because it, all these things form one jigsaw, don't they? They're all pieces in the same jigsaw. If God is love, if love never fails, then you have to rethink the whole jigsaw puzzle of your theology in the, in the, context, in the context of that. Um, Kathy's uh, said so much about these passages, uh, uh, the 1 Corinthians passage, and, and I guess all, all applies as well to the 1 Timothy passage, and uh, so I, I won't, won't say anything else. But practically, I've talked about culturally, theologically, and practically, practically, um, but what began to happen is in 2003, I published the book, The Lost Message of Jesus, um, uh, with this underpinning theme. But it was in 2003, exactly the same year as I got into trouble, a lot of trouble. Uh, I was called a heretic for the first time. Um, and that goes on on a daily basis. Today, it's been a uh, strong uh, reaction. I, uh, daily, I receive letters about my heresy. I'll return to that in a bit. But in 2003, two other huge things happened in the life of Oasis. One is that we inherited a central London building, which is now called Oasis Church in Waterloo and has already been referred to. It was a giant building. It'd been there a long time, but it was completely empty. It had a very small congregation of about 10 people and it was shut for the rest of the week, completely shut. I became the minister of it. I am a Baptist minister. It was a Baptist church. They had no money. The church was bankrupt. Um, so I became a, a minister there for, um, for nothing. I'd just come along on a Sunday, but the church was dead. And so what it allowed me to do was begin to develop the church along the lines of the theology that I was growing into. And there was no opposition. Um, often church leaders will come to me and they say, Steve, I, I wish I had your courage. I wish I could step out and say the things that you've said. I understand, actually, that not everyone's in the same position as me. I, my salary was being paid by Oasis. I wasn't being paid by this church. There was hardly anyone there to oppose me anyway. Uh, this church had no chance of finding another minister right in the centre of London, uh, which uh, uh, with nothing uh, going on. And so these people who didn't employ me, the few of them, couldn't sack me even if they wanted to. Um, I hope that tells you a little bit about the situation that many leaders find themselves in. In a moment, I'm going to talk about courage, but the, the reality is that as church leaders come to see me or leaders of Christian agencies and leaders of denominations, I mean the leaders of denominations come and sit down with me, almost as though I've become a, um, a, a father confessor in, in a Catholic tradition. It's quite extraordinary. People will come and they sit and they tell me why they wish they could be more inclusive, but they can't do what I can do and they can't write what I've written and I understand their position fear of losing a job a house concern about the security of their children I find all the time that church leaders are scared of being thrown out of their churches by their congregations strange thing is I often talk to members of a congregation who'll say I really agree with you, Steve. If only the leaders in our situation would have the courage to do something about this. So everyone ends up scared of someone else. The, the publisher of a magazine is scared of losing subscriptions. The head of a Christian relief agency is, head, is scared of lose, losing funding. The head of a denomination is scared of a, 
uh, schism in, in the church and, and countries or individual churches leaving. Um, but I found myself not to be in that situation uh, in the sense that Oasis Church in Waterloo could adopt an inclusive position and welcome um, people who were LGBT plus in, and there was no one to sack me. The other thing about it is the church is in Waterloo in London, which is right in the heart and right next to Vauxhall, which at the time was, um, if you like, the gay centre of London or South London. So it, so it, once people who were homosexual knew that they were welcome, the word went round, they all told their friends and more uh, began to arrive. The other big thing that was happening to us in 2003 is we were beginning to start schools. In fact, our first school, um, it really took root that year. As I say, there are now 53 of them and thousands and thousands of staff um, and also tens of thousands of students. Well, with that many students and that many staff, however you um, guess at the percentage of LGBT uh, DBT plus people in society, that's a lot of, of, of homosexual staff it's huge numbers of students questioning their sexuality and on a journey. And so I felt an obligation to create a protection for everyone as well. My situation was very different to that of others. Lastly, I'd like to talk about, I'm gonna talk about the role of the church going forward. I think I've still got some minutes to do that. But um, I'd like to talk about courage as well. Um, it took the Oasis board nine months to allow me to speak up publicly about what my views were and what Oasis Church in Waterloo had become and effectively the policy that we were already running through all our schools and community projects across the country. I'd suggested I write for an evangelical magazine uh, uh, called uh, Christianity. Uh, I was a columnist at the time and they were scared stiff. So the board asked me to produce the paper, that, the article, the paper, long paper that I was going to write. I also asked Christianity Magazine if I could do this. The incredible thing is it went all the way to our board who, who talked up. We had special board meetings. Um, we invited people in. They were so scared about the loss of income to Oasis. I was concerned because I knew that anything I did or said could have impact on other staff. My bold words, inverted commas, could cost someone their livelihood because we lose funding. Equally, this paper went all the way to the board of Christianity magazine who debated it and eventually said it could be published as long as at the same time I made it clear uh, but at the same time, two things happened. One, they could publish a paper um, along the more biblical line, as they put it, and, so, and two, that they could announce that I would be retiring from writing a regular monthly column with them. I'd written for them for over 20 years every month. But eventually, our board agreed nervously. Um, their board agreed nervously with those two caveats. Why did I choose to write in that magazine? Because if you're going to say something, I believe we have um, a responsibility to say it as loud and as clearly to as many people as possible. And I knew by saying it in this way, it would create uh, not just ripples, but waves, and it would create a debate. I wanted it to be a gracious debate. Uh, I think we've already talked about that. Everything we say needs to be said with love, recognising that we are on journeys ourselves. It's not that we've suddenly arrived. Every theological position that we consider permanent uh, is actually only provisional in the end, isn't it? Because we're growing and we're learning. So I wanted a gracious debate. The debate happened uh, I can't say in all honesty, it became gracious because of the exclusions that Oasis suffered 
as a result. It did cost us a lot of money. But the truth is, because Oasis had wider roots, to use that term again, in terms of funding from government agencies and all sorts of other places, although it cost us, um, we were in a position where it wasn't going to wipe us out. Personally, it's hard for us all still on some days uh, I, this afternoon I opened a letter which was uh, totally condemning of me um, and uh, some days that's a hard thing to deal with the funny thing is that I'd said to my the trustees of Oasis the board of Oasis uh, over a long time I said if you allow me to publish something perhaps well I could write it and then we publish it after my death. And then we had a, believe it or not, we had a debate about that. And it, we realized soon that that would be worse because I'd be dead and whoever were, was left would be left with a problem. And then it was, I, I thought, well, perhaps we should publish under another name. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote several books under different names. And, and then we realized that was wrong, that actually we need to, to stand up for, for what we believe. Oasis works in several African countries, works in Uganda, uh, where um, uh, homosexual activity is uh, a capital uh, uh, offence. We work in India. Um, there were countries that, that threatened to leave Oasis. I've found that the bully um, lives off bullying. And, um, and that's not to say that our staff were bullies at all, but there were, there were some people who agitated. But the truth is, um, a decade um, or so or more uh, further on, nobody's left. And, and the organisation of our work on the ground, our Christ-centred work has grown uh, everywhere. In the closing minutes, um, I want to talk about the role of the church going forward. I hope that telling you something of my story um, uh, and our story has helped. It's been... Uh, a painful and hard uh, journey, but a great journey. I reflect often that whatever abuse is thrown at me or us, it's only a tiny, tiny echo of the abuse and the rejection and the exclusion that people who I love who are LGBT have to suffer all of the time. I spent uh, yesterday, uh, part of yesterday evening, talking with a really good friend of mine uh, in his 50s, um, a really good friend of mine, who, um, who these, these uh, last few days has got himself into a really poor place in terms of his mental health um, again, and had ended up taking some drugs. He's a really committed, passionate follower of Jesus but he's gay, um, he grew up in Northern Ireland, he grew up in the end hating himself, he came to London uh, to get away from what, from the homophobia he had discovered, but then he discovered that homophobia was internal, he hated himself for his thoughts, for who he was, and occasionally for his actions, he promised God time and time again, that he would live a celibate life. And every now and then he was overwhelmed. So in the end, and this is a common story actually, he began taking drugs, not because he was fascinated by drugs, but as he said to me time and time again, I started taking the drugs, Steve, because I realized I was reaching a point where I was going to get involved in a piece of sordid pornography or a one night stand because I was denied a relationship and I hated myself for it. And I knew that God hated me even more, the shame I felt. So I took the drugs before these episodes when I couldn't resist anymore because that way I'd it would numb the sense of hatred, God's hatred for me that I felt. And it was a way of surviving. This is very real for people. And that links into the role of the church going, going forward. I think that three things I'd like to say. One is we need to have this conversation with grace, even though we feel the intense pain of the way that people are treated. 
we need to understand in what's already been said that we should understand the word sin as damage or harm. We know the harm that is being done by this misinterpretation of the Bible, misunderstanding of the God of love. But we also have to acknowledge that we are on a journey which we've not reached the end of and extend a grace to people. By this shall all people know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. We need a gracious conversation and on our part, we need to keep extending that. The second thing is that we do need to push forward graciously because in terms of safeguarding, we are falling, at failing. Forgive me for using UK illustrations, but in the last few weeks, there's been the results of a giant inquiry that took place into the Church of England around a, the sexual abuse scandal that's run for years. Time after time, the church turning a blind eye to the sexual abuse of children and teenagers. And this, of course, as some of you will know, has ended in endless court cases. The Catholic Church finds itself in exactly the same position around the world. But a report, uh, an inquiry, a national inquiry reporting back just two weeks ago, said of the Church of England that this sexual abuse was rampant and the real problem was this, that the Church of England was driven more by keeping its reputation than pursuing truth. What mattered to it was reputation. So it pushed things under the carpet. The point is this, there is another uh, ser a, a series of calamities coming around the spiritual, the emotional, and the psychological abuse of LGBT people in our churches. A minor, a young person, a vulnerable adult steps forward and tells their pastor or those they trust about their homosexual feelings because they have to be honest with someone about who they are, only to be told that this isn't honoring to God. It's, it's not optimally what God wants for your life they are prayed over they are led for prayer and healing pastoral care becomes spiritual and psychological abuse in the end uh, it, 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 it results in all sorts of practices which demonize the person I have a friend who uh, cried one day he's in his mid-30s and he cried in a uh, uh, he cried in a communion service I was taking. This is a few years ago. And I, I thought I said something wrong, something to hurt him. And I went over and I put my arm around him. I knew he was gay. I put my arm around him and I apologized to him. And he said, Steve, it's not that you've done anything wrong. He said, as I sat in this communion service and soaked in God's love, love that never fails, I finally realized that my problems in life He'd become alcoholic, he was anorexic, and he never had a relationship with anyone because he'd gone in on himself. He said, I realise, Steve, that my problems in life aren't because I'm gay. My problems are because I'm evangelical. I believe that churches need to create sanctuary and we need to work hard, whatever our understanding of 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, Romans, uh, Levitical passages, etc. are. We have to create sanctuary. And if pastorally we're not driven out of love to do that, actually as denominations and as leaders, we have to acknowledge that in days to come, we will be held accountable for reputation mattering more than our safeguarding of those in our care. And lastly, as I close, um, I'd like to uh, simply uh, uh, read you uh, some words from scripture. You probably know, I'm sure you know, that Acts chapter 9, 10 and 11 are a giant story about how this good news about Jesus first becomes known on a mass scale to people totally outside the Jewish tradition, the Gentiles. It's the story of Peter and Cornelius, the centurion, the Italian centurion who, uh, 
who uh, who meets with Peter, you know the story, and Peter recognizes that God's spirits are working in his life, even though the theology he has, the God that he has, means that that this can't be happening. So he has a theology and he has a God, but the shape of his God and the shape of his theology don't fit what's going on. And in the end, he acknowledges what's happening. And so, as you know, he he prays for and he baptizes Cornelius and his whole family. Anyway, word gets back to Jerusalem. And this is what it says at the beginning of Acts chapter 11. It says soon the news reached the apostles and the other believers in, in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, some of the Jewish believers heavily criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. So Peter stretches the frontiers of mission. This passage, of course, is written in the context of inclusion, the very context we're talking about. And Peter stretches the frontiers of mission. But rather on getting back to Jerusalem, the headquarters of the church and being applauded or celebrated, he's carpeted. That's the reality. Those who press on in the fr on the frontiers of inclusion, who stretch our understanding of theology, who point out that our, our theology and our shape of the shape of the God that we worship is wrong, often they end up being carpeted. Um, but everyone is dependent in the end on heretics, for it's heretics who drive forward mission. The reality is that although Peter was carpeted for what he did, if he had not done those things, we wouldn't be having this conference tonight. He stretched the imagination as he understood for the first time that God's desire was to include everyone. The church has always been dependent on those who will go further. Jesus himself, of course, crucified as a heretic for blasphemy by people who had a shape of God and a theological shape that was too small and too uh, uninclusive. This is our task. It's to continue to live out the spirit of the whole book of Acts, which is constantly stretching us as we move ahead with a God whose love never fails for anyone.